Good morning everyone, uh, welcome to this second part of the classification lecture. So, basically last time we saw a couple of uh, kind of basic methods for doing classification. So, we did a nearest neighbor classification and something called as decision trees. So, the goal of today's lecture is to see how you can make these classifiers even more accurate or more powerful. So, what we will see today is, uh, is the idea of uh, kind of bringing in the, uh, the power of multiple uh, classifiers. So, we will take say 6 of the uh, k nearest neighbor classification systems, 5 of random trees or uh, decision trees and then combine them together to make a new classifier which has better accuracy than any one of these guys. Right. So, the idea is to, uh, is to bring together the advantages of these different methods, combine them in a way that you could get a, a new classifier which performs better than any of them put uh, any of them by themselves. So, this idea is also called as uh, ensemble classification where you put together a bunch of different classifiers to generate a, a new classifier right. Okay. So, just as a reminder the classification problem is defined like the following right. So, you have set of k classes omega 1 to omega k uh, and a feature vector e right. So, the goal is to learn a function f which takes in this feature vector e and spits out a predicted class right. So, it is this thing. So, c is the prediction that your classifier makes. Right. Uh, last time we looked into the problem of binary classification where k is basically 2. So, you have only 2 classes is it a cat is it not a cat is it a car is it not a car right. So, something like this. So, we will build upon this idea. So, uh, we will use the feature the classifiers that we had developed last time put them together and make something better. Right. So, before we uh, do this just as a reminder I would like to uh, maybe summarize a bit the nearest neighbor classifier right. So, if you have say your feature vector is 2 dimensional. So, you have x 1 dimension here and x 2 and say you have some data points uh, like this. So, you have right. So, these are training examples. So, the plus corresponds to the examples from the positive class so omega 1 maybe and minus from omega 2. So, what was the idea of the nearest neighbor? If I give you a new example say something that lies here what would be the predicted class of this point plus or minus uh, this point here it is plus because the idea is that you use the nearest neighbor in this case it is a one nearest neighbor. So, you find the nearest point in your training space that right? so, it is this one and the classification is this is the class of your training point itself. So, in this case since the nearest point in the training set is plus uh, is a sample with the class plus the uh, the class of this point will also be plus right. We also said that you can not only have nearest neighbor with one neighbor, but with two. So, so now with the nearest neighbor with k equals to 2 what would be the uh, the class of this point. Right, so, it depends. So, maybe if I assume that this point is closer to minus right. So, then the two then you need to look at the two nearest neighbors. So, the first nearest neighbor for this point is this guy and the second one this one right. So, you have one sample which says it is a positive class the other which says it is a negative one. So, it is a tie you cannot really choose between one or the other right. What if you have a, a, a classifier which uses three neighbors? In this case? Yes. Yes. 
the measure is the number of uh, the number of samples with some class right so if you take 3 it will always be a plus because no matter where you are if you look at the three nearest neighbors even if the point is very far if you look at the three nearest neighbors you will have two pluses and one minus so the classification will always give a plus yeah but if you are interested in some threshold for example so the threshold here is the k itself right so the k says look at one nearest neighbor two nearest neighbor three nearest neighbor there are no more thresholds uh, but if you have a class undefined also yeah right so there are some special cases where you may have more complicated cases but in a simple uh, simple k nearest neighbor classification system you just look at the classes of the k nearest neighbors and then check which is the maximum number of classes and this is the class of your sample point right so with this no matter where your point is you get a plus but this is not really a very good uh, good solution because it's plus just because there are more data points of plus than minus right so what was this situation called as so if you remember last time so this what we did so when we use a, a three nearest neighbor uh, solution basically what we are doing is underfitting because no matter where your point is it will just give plus just because of the way your model was trained right instead if you have the opposite uh, case where for example you have say lots of pluses which are clustered in one day, one place and lots of say minuses which are in another place but just by some noise you have another sample which is a minus sitting in between this cluster now if i ask you what's the class of this point here if you consider a one nearest neighbor classifier what is it so what's the class of this point considering a one nearest neighbor classifier it's a minus because the closest point is a sample which is the minus one right but the thing is if you look at the data this is not the answer that you're looking for you would want this point to be sampled as a plus because most of the points nearby are positive right so what what we did here or this situation is known as overfitting so this particular point or our classifier overfit to one data sample and not to the general trend that is there right do you remember what we had uh, proposed to kind of solve this problem of overfitting and underfitting yeah so we saw this idea of cross validation right so you test your classifier on the training data or you train your classifier on the training data and then test it on a different data set which is not a part of the original training data set right so in this case what is this parameter we want to fix it's this k right so the number of nearest neighbors is what we want to fix so what we could do is take our training data set right then artificially remove for example some of the points then figure out what's the accuracy given a one nearest neighbor solution figure out what's the accuracy given a two uh, ne nearest neighbor solution and so on right and when you have this uh, results from using different case then you can say okay it looks like for my uh, for my uh, test k equals to say two works the best or so on so we also saw this idea of cross validation where you train on only a part of your training set and test on the remaining part to figure out how well your classifier actually is right okay so this was one kind of classification system that we saw what was the other one so for example if we have uh, say a data set which looks something like This is not a good one. Okay, so suppose we have this data set, and the other idea that we had seen was this idea of decision trees, right? So we, we said that we'll ask a sequence of questions, and based on the answers to this sequence of questions, we will divide up the space 
and figure out what's the class for a new sample. Right? For example, one decision tree that could uh, be for this guy would be maybe we draw a line here and one here. So basically it ends up being this area. And so the first question you ask is say x1 greater than some threshold theta1 and use the second test you make is x2 uh, say also greater than some threshold theta2 right so if the answers to this solution is such that you end up on this side of the space then it's a positive uh, sample and if it ends up on this side of the space then it's a negative is this idea clear with the decision trees? So we break up the space by asking questions, right? So we say, okay, given a sample point, is the x1 greater than uh, some threshold theta1? So if it's on the right side, let's say if it's on the right side, we call it, uh, uh, let's say, let's do the opposite way. So let's say if this condition is true, the sample is a positive one. So the first condition, for example, could be is x1 less than some threshold theta1? So this is theta 1 here. Right. Then we say that it's a positive sample. This is true. But also there is some positive samples which is on the right side of this theta 1. So we need another level in the decision tree. Then we ask the question is x2, so on this y axis here, is it greater than some value theta 2? So this line is the value theta 2. So if the sample lies above this, it's again a positive sample. So we ask a series of questions to break up the space and figure out what's the class of a new point. Right? So is this ideas, these two ideas clear because today we'll be building on these ideas how to join, combine them together to make a stronger classifier. Right? Okay. If that is the case then let's start off with this idea. So the methods that we will see today are called as ensemble methods. So like I said the key idea is to use multiple simple classifiers often these are called weak classifiers because by themselves they are not very confident what the class of a point is but if you combine a bunch of them together you can say something more and we'll see in particular two approaches uh, one is called bagging and another called boosting so we'll see how these work so these are two ideas where you put together multiple individual classifiers. So this could be multiple decision trees, one decision tree and a, a, a nearest neighbor classifier or any other classifier that you can come across. How to put them together and make them stronger. Right? So, okay, so let's start off with the idea of bagging. So essentially bagging, uh, uh, it stands for bootstrap aggregation. I think they just combine the word together to make bagging somehow. And uh, the idea of bagging is the following. So you have your original training data set. So you have your feature vectors and the corresponding class omega. So this could be, say, images of lots of uh, pictures with cats and, say, dogs. And you would have these pictures of cats and dogs in the E here and the omega is the corresponding class. So saying, is it a cat, is it a dog? Right. So you have n of these examples. Right. So what we do with this bagging approach is that we make multiple uh, data sets given this bigger data set with n elements. So what you do is make smaller data sets, say with n1 elements, then another one with n2 elements and so on. And these elements, when you make these data sets, they are kind of randomly sampled. So we'll see how they're sampling in the next slide. But essentially what you end up is you take your big data set, break it up into bunch of smaller data sets. So in this case, you have NB number of smaller data sets. And then the idea is uh, you learn a classifier on each of these data sets. So on the first part of the data set you learn the classifier F1, on the second part you learn F2 and so on till FB. So now you have B classifiers, so maybe 10 classifiers and the idea is straightforward. So given these 10 classifiers, take the majority vote. Right? So if six of them say it's a cat and four say it's a dog, it's a cat. So you just count the number of guys who say it's omega 1 
count the number of guys who say it's omega 2 and take the majority of these two, right. Okay, as you may kind of intuitively guess that if these uh, classifiers that we trained F1, F2 and F3 so on kind of if they are good in particular cases which the other guys are not good in then overall if you ask all of them a majority vote could yield you a better solution right. right so to think of it conversely would be if, if each of these newly trained classifiers roughly do the same thing for example all of them just look at the eyes of the cat or the dog and say it's it's a cat or a dog then all of them kind of perform the same so if f1 makes a mistake f2 will also make a mistake f3 is also likely to make a mistake right so we should train these classifiers on data sets such that they kind of develop expertise in different things for example one classifier could look at the eyes and say it's a cat the other one should look at the tail and say it's a cat and so on so just an analogy right so each of these classifiers should become an expert in different things should become good in different things and therefore even a small subset of it becomes wrong overall as a majority vote you get the correct classifier classification is this idea clear okay <laughs> right so this uh, so this was the idea of bagging the other idea that I mentioned is the one of boosting so previously we just broke up our data set the training data set into say n paths and created n classifiers on these paths individually right. So now the idea is slightly different so what we do is we take a part of the data set train a classifier f1 then we look at those examples which the f1 classifies badly. So suppose we had 10 images again of cats and dogs right and we train a classifier f1 this may be a decision tree right then the classifier says for 8 out of the 10 pictures that uh, given cats they are cats but for 2 pictures which are cats it says they are dogs right. So the idea here is to take those 2 training points which were wrongly classified and then train another classification system which performs well on these 2 wrongly classified examples. So the goal is to emphasize on the thing of, on the data samples that were classified wrongly and then use this information to retrain a new classifier then uh, kind of put them all together to come up with a better classifier then each one of them would have been individually. So is the idea of boost or the difference between bagging and boosting clear. So in the bagging you have kind of individual data sets each of them tr can be trained parallelly and then a majority vote amongst their decisions gives you the, uh, the final classification answer whereas in boosting it is a sequential building you build a classifier F1 you find out that it is not good on these examples you build a classifier F2 which has better performance for these wrongly classified examples and so on right. Yeah. how to use uh, so we will see exactly how the boosting system works but it is basically based on the uh, yeah we will see exactly what is the uh, what is the precision bagging as well right ok. So yeah so this was the idea I said so you have a sequence of uh, of learned classifiers so there you could still get B classifiers but instead of learning them parallelly you do them sequentially and there is another concept of weights of each of these uh, classifiers. So you end up with uh, B classifiers but each of them having a weight which kind of uh, represents the idea coming from the fact that there are some examples which are being classified wrongly and then we will map those wrong classifier wrong classified examples to this way. So this was the answer to the question how do you uh, how do you uh, account for the wrong examples but in boosting whereas in bagging it is just parallel uh, training. So we will see how exactly bagging works. So there is this idea of uh, random forest so it is another classification system essentially which joins multiple decision trees so you take say 10 decision trees 
and then use this idea of bagging. And so a bunch of trees make up a forest, and therefore they name random forests. The idea, like we said before, is take your data set, break it up into n small or b small data sets here, train on each of these data sets separately, and a majority vote. Right? So in this case, if you, uh, if you compare with the boosting method, there are no weights. So in a sense, all the uh, classifiers contribute equally to the final decision. Again, so last time we had seen this uh, decision tree, so how it looks. So it's the same example that we saw here, but represented as a graph. So this is the first question you ask, then you have two branches, yes or no. Whenever you have this square uh, node, it's a leaf node, so you know if something ends up here, you can assign it a class, right? So you, you've seen this last time. The idea this time is the following. You train a bunch of these guys, so B of these guys, ask each of them to make a prediction. So given your feature vector E, it goes on top of this tree, and you either end up, you end up in basically one of these leaf nodes, so you'll either end up with C1 or C2, right? You do this for each one of your tree that's there in your forest, and then you ask for a majority vote. Whichever has the maximum number of votes, say C1 or C2, this is the class of your, uh, of your, this is the class that your random forest predicts, right? <coughs> right so just a small uh, recap into what the decision trees were. So if you remember, we asked a sequence of questions which split these input spaces. Uh, if you also remember how we split these, uh, split these, uh, how did we ask the questions to split the space in the, in the feature uh, space, right? So we, we would ask those questions uh, which would decrease the entropy or the Gini index. Right? So the way one should ask questions is that it makes the resulting partitions as unambiguous as possible, right? Okay, so this was an example where we saw, again, you have, uh, you have two features, X1 and X2. And the goal is to classify the circles from the squares. And finally, you end up with this particular partition, where everything on the left of, uh, of W10 is a circle, whereas everything, on the, uh, everything which is on the right of W10 and above W20 is a square. And this stuff here, again, is, uh, is a circle. Right? So this is exactly the same idea that we saw here. Okay, so this was just one of these trees. So if you look here, what we looked at is how one of these guys work here, what we did in the last lecture. Now the idea is how to use the same data set efficiently so as to learn different kinds of classifiers. So what we do is we randomly split up our training data. So if you assume that we had M samples in our original training data, so E11, E21, and so on. So E1 corresponds to the first training sample. E11 is just the first element of the training sample and so on. So the first row is the first training sample. So this is the feature vector and the corresponding class omega1. Right? So in your original data set, you had, say, M of these guys. Now we want to break it up into several smaller data sets. So what we do is, this is an example, say just say we take six out of these, say M is 100, so we take six out of these 100 examples. We select randomly and we select with replacement in the sense that uh, suppose we selected here the, uh, the second row E21, we don't remove it from the, uh, from let's say the back, we let it be there and therefore if you select again, it may happen that by chance you select the same sample again. So it's uh, sampling with replacement, right? Okay, so this is one kind of sampling. So what we saw was sampling in terms of rows. So we take a subset of the samples. There's one kind of sampling that we are doing. To mix it up again, the other kind of sampling we do is we don't take all the columns. So we don't take all the features. Right, so this would mean that if you, if you are describing a cat, maybe the color of the cat, the eyes of the cat, whether it has a tail or not, all of these are different features. 
But what we do is that we don't consider all of them together. We just take a subset of these, uh, these features. Right? And then we end up with a new smaller data set, which has fewer rows, so fewer samples, and fewer columns, which means less elements of the, um, of the feature space. Right? Then what we do is on each one of these smaller data sets, we train or we learn a decision tree. And so if we broke, break, broke up our original data set into 10 parts, we will learn 10 of these guys. And so the 10 trees form a forest. And then essentially, we ask each of the tree to make a prediction which class it is. Is it a cat? Is it a dog? And then we take a majority vote. Right? Is this idea clear what we are doing with combining multiple uh, Ran, uh, multiple decision trees to form a forest. And the idea of this sampling is to somehow make it more robust, right? So if we only use a subset of the original data set, then we kind of ensure that the resulting forest or the resulting decision tree that you learn is not overfit to the data. This is one advantage. And if you only use a subset of the columns, then the decision you are making is using different features. Right? So you also get some robustness in terms of what features you use. So for example, when you collect the data, maybe some uh, features are not as reliable as the other ones. For example, due to some reason, the feature which says, does the cat have a tail, is not as good as one that detects the color of the cat's eyes. Right? So this means that if we overly depend on the on the feature whether the cat or whether the animal has a tail or not, then we may make, we may make some errors. Right? So in this way, when we randomly sample over the feature space or the which features to use, we also develop some robustness in terms of the decision trees that we develop. Right? So some of the trees would, would become kind of experts on detecting cats by using, say, eyes and the color only. Some of them would become experts by detecting cats at using tail and eyes and so on and so forth. Right? So in this sense, we, we learn different classifiers, different trees, which are expert in different ways. And the hope is that on average, so when you ask for the majority vote, you are better than not, uh, you are better than using just any one of them. Right? Okay, uh, there's some other uh, properties which are kind of interesting in here. Yeah? It's random. But it, so how do we define those random? So it's random, but how do we define those dimensions? I mean, if we have a cat, um, how do we say uh, that it is without a tail? I mean, no, I mean, there is, so there's the picture of the cat, yes. and there is some system which figures out features from the cat. Okay, that's it. Right, so this is the E, right? So you need to generate E from the image. But of course, you can also directly work on the image as well, right? So then you would need to argue in terms of pixel values, right, and so on. So I just gave this example because it's easy to think of it in terms of features. So you need a feature detector. Given your raw data, you need to get some information from that raw data which you think helps to classify the system. Right? And once you have the E, just randomly choose some of the values. Okay. Okay, so I was talking about the uh, properties of this random forest in addition to being somehow naturally uh, accounting for overfitting by doing this subsampling of the data sets. The, uh, the other advantages is that it's easy to parallelize. So if you think of it, each decision tree after it's being trained or even during training, it's independent of every other tree. Right? So if you have a computer with multiple cores or even a GPU, you could just ask each core to do one of these calculations. And so you, you gain in terms of parallelization. Even though your complexity increased because now say you have 10 classifiers instead of just one, you can do them in parallel and therefore all of them can run parallelly and then give you the answer kind of together. Right? <laughs> okay. And another property apparently is that it's easy to implement and therefore, it's also an advantage. This, I guess, is subjective. But in the end, if you have one decision tree, you just need 
10 copies of those decision trees to, to make a random, uh, random forest. Right? Okay, so uh, just as an example, uh, if you have played with the Kinect, uh, it has uh, or at least some of the games use this body part classification where depending on the game, if it needs to detect your hands or legs or your movements, you would like to know which part is your hand and how it's moving and so on. And so one of the, uh, one of the uh, rather famous examples is where they trained multiple human poses, so about a million of them and then they trained for a day to come up with a huge forest and this then makes the decision which gives you a result something like this. So these different parts or different colors correspond to the different parts of the body and then based on the logic of your game you use this information. So it's say it's a tennis game then you figure out how or which one is which part is your hand and how this hand is moving and so on. Right? So the idea that we saw of using random forest not just works for simple problems like these or just 2D problems but really difficult problems where you need to detect parts of the bodies and, uh, and track them over time for example. Right. Okay, so just as a summary what we saw in random forests uh, we use multiple decision trees. The decision tree itself is like we saw last time so you get in your training data there is something special about this training data that it is not the entire training data but a randomly sub sampled part of this training data. You learn n of these uh, training, uh, you learn n of these decision trees and then ask each one of them to make a prediction and take a majority vote upon this prediction. Right. So is this idea of uh, random forest clear or this idea of, of, uh, of this bagging clear? Yeah. So this bagging idea need not be just with decision trees, right? So you could also think of this bagging idea with carry nearest neighbors because all that bagging says is that don't use the entire data set but make uh, subsets of this and train your data set, right? So this bagging concept applies not just to decision trees but any other uh, classification system that we have seen or that say you develop one tomorrow, you can take advantage of this bagging idea. Okay, next we move on to uh, this idea of boosting and in particular this one algorithm which you may have heard it is called ADA boost. Uh, it is one recipe of how to do boosting and uh, today we will kind of solve an example both on the blackboard and on the slides we will see how to do uh, boosting. Right. So with boosting it is again an ensemble method which means that you, uh, you take advantage of multiple so, so called weak classifiers in the sense that each one of them is not very good but they are better than random guessing. So if some classifier is just as good as random guessing then it is no use so then you could just flip a coin. Random guessing is half right so the probability of any class is half. So we need to have a set of classifiers which is better than random guessing given such classifiers boosting says that we, we, we combine these different classifiers in a specific way that your overall classifier is much better and in this case the specific way is the following. So you end up with a new classifier which is a weighted uh, combination of these individual classifiers that you learn but there is a special way in which these individual classifiers are learned. And this special way is, is the fact that you use the examples from your training set which were classified wrongly in the previous by the previous uh, classifiers. So for example, uh, I have the classifier F1 which classifies 8 examples correctly and 2 wrongly. So I should design F2 in a way that it classifies the remaining 2 in a better manner right? and then uh, put them together somehow. So we will see exactly with an example how this works and so uh, okay so and the idea is this this one of combining multiple weak classifiers uh, called h of x here so there is a slight deviation in the notation so till previous slide we were calling the classifier f just to make it consistent with what you would read in the literature for example it is commonly uh, the, the, uh, the 
The symbol used is H, especially with boosting algorithms. So we would have multiple of these H of X's, right? So they're called uh, weak classifiers or inaccurate rules. And the goal is to come out with this capital H, which is a combination of this multiple one or multiple small H's. Okay, so the uh, the algorithm we'll be seeing today is called Ada Boost, and it's kind of proposed by these two guys here, and uh, and in the end we will end up with a classifier H, which uh, is defined as the sign. So this is just plus or minus of f of x, where f of x is nothing but a linear combination of the individual classifiers H, right? So this sign comes up because of the following reason. So uh, instead of saying that the classification system gives the output as omega 1 or omega 2, again, we'll consider only binary classification. Uh, instead of saying that the class is omega 1 or omega 2, it just is nice if we call, uh, mathematically it becomes kind of nice if we just replace omega 1 by say plus 1 and omega 2 by minus 1. And when we say sine of some function, so say sine of some number that is say minus 0.5, this would return minus 1 because the sine of this number is minus 1 and this corresponds to the class omega 2. It's just the mapping between omega 1 to plus and omega 2 to minus 1, right? Okay. Okay, so what exactly does Ada Boost do, right? So uh, one could think of Ada Boost as a way of picking up what the best features are, and uh, this is done by seeing what examples that the current classifier classifies wrongly. So it picks out, okay, which are these uh, examples which are which are classified wrongly currently and then tries to come up with a new classifier which uses the features in a better way. And in some sense, you could say we are choosing what the best features are for this particular classifier, say FK, right? It also helps us figure out what the thresholds are. So for example, if we use a decision tree, tree we have these thresholds theta 1, theta 2, and so on. So Ada Boost will provide a way how to fix these thresholds. And then it gives us a way how to combine them. So this combination comes from these terms alpha, right? So the Ada Boost will tell us what alpha one should be, what alpha two should be, what alpha three should be, and so on. Right? So since our classifier is basically a combination of smaller classifiers, we need need to know what uh, power should we give to say H one versus what power we give to H two, and so on. And so this algorithm, whatever will uh, is proposed, should figure out in some reasonable manner what this alpha 1 and alpha 2 are. You could think of these alphas somehow as a voting power. Right? So when you had this random forest, all of them had equal voting power. It's like in our elections, all of our votes are the same. Right? In some sense, error boost is a bit biased. It says some votes are better than the other votes and this is, uh, is, is through this uh, alphas. <coughs> okay. Uh, there are some advantages of the Ada Boost. Essentially, it's a nonlinear classifier, so which basically means that even if your data is is not linearly separable, for example, if you have this training data set, it's linearly separable because you can draw a line between them which separates the positive to the negative ones. But suppose you have one which is like this, this data set is no longer linearly separable, right? You at least need two lines if you need to, uh, to separate them. Or you, it could be much more complex, so the shape could be something like this. So you may need some nonlinear decision boundaries to uh, to make these separations. So Ada Boost will uh, allow you to make these nonlinear separations in the, in the feature space. Okay. 
Okay. Right, so, uh, again, like I said before, to make this ADA boost work or make this kind of boosting algorithm work, you need classifiers which are better than random guessing. And so, if you just have some classifier whose accuracy is 0.5, then there's no use in combining hundreds of them because all of them are just as bad and there's no use to combine them, right? So, we should have some method which is a weak classifier, so which may not be very good, but the uh, error should be at least less than 0.5. Right? Okay, so today the example that we'll be mainly focusing on is boosting using what is called as a decision stump. So we saw the decision tree where we ask a sequence of questions and this determines the class. A decision part is just the top question of the, dis uh, the decision stump is just the top question of the decision tree, which means that you just ask one question. And so if you ask the feature x1 is greater than some, uh, some threshold theta1, if the answer is yes, then it's omega1 or plus1. If the answer is no, it's uh, minus1. Right? So we'll build a boosting algorithm which will merge multiple of these decision stumps so it's a dumb decision tree, a decision tree with just one node basically, right? And we'll see how to put multiple one of them together to come out with something that's good than any of these one questions that you have. Right? So in principle, the idea of boosting again, like the idea of bagging, is not just limited to decision trees. You could do boosting with, say, two nearest neighbor classifiers, three decision trees, four decision stumps, and even other methods like the one mentioned here. We won't look how this works, but there's a classification system called as support vector machines. So you could use a bunch of support vector machines as well. And so what boosting says is that you have all these classifiers which are weak, so which are not perfect by themselves. I will give you an algorithm on how to combine them and in what order to for example, do the classification and so on. Okay. So, is this idea clear what we are going to do with boosting? Okay. Okay. So, since we are going to work with decision stumps, uh, it makes sense to uh, understand what a decision stump is. It's like I said, it's one question out of the decision tree. And so, if you plot this uh, here, so you have again two dimensions x1 and x2 and we want to separate the red dots from the blue ones. In this case, a decision stump is sufficient, right? So you just ask one question, is the x1 uh, greater than or less than this particular value theta? And then it's sufficient to uh, solve your problem or to separate the space, right? Anyway, so this one line that we see here is a decision stump because it corresponds to one question, right? And the way to write it uh, mathematically would be uh, like this. So you have the decision stump here given by x, uh, given by h. It will take in the feature vector x. So again, there's a slight change in notation before this was called e. So it needs the feature vector x. Then uh, we'll see what j is and then it needs a threshold theta. Then it makes a test. Is the uh, uh, it makes the following test, say one element of this particular feature vector, is it greater than or less than some, uh, some threshold theta and then gives you a decision, right? Uh, the, the question G comes as the following because you could think of two questions actually uh, that you could ask from X1 and theta1. So one would be this question. So if X1 is greater than theta1, then you make this particular assignment. The other question that you could ask is if x1 is less than theta1, then you uh, assign the same class. So basically, it's exactly the opposite. So these two decision stumps are the opposite of each other. Right? So for example, in this case, say if this is a dis decision stump and this says everything to the right is blue, then this decision stump has no errors. It classifies everything correctly. But if I take the opposite decision stump, which says everything on the right is 
read, it makes 100% errors, right? So for every decision line, you can think of it as two weak classifiers, two decision stems, right? So if you define one, you kind of get the other one for free. Right? <coughs> okay, and then, uh, like I said before, the goal is to to add up a bunch of these guys to come up with something that's better. Right? Okay, uh, yeah. So the way this J works is to do this flip of the sign, right? So if if p is plus one, then the condition or the decision stump we are considering is is the jth column or the jth feature vector is greater than some theta. Instead, if pj is minus one, it just switches this decision, uh, the direction of the decision. Right. <coughs> okay. So what does it mean uh, to train a stump? Right. So last time we saw training a decision tree, right? So in training the decision tree, we talked about splitting the space such that the entropy or the, the, the noise kind of in, uh, in the splitted partitions is as small as possible, right? For a decision stump, it's kind of easier because you just have one question or one threshold theta one to decide. You say that give me that theta Right, which minimizes the uh, the weighted error. So what you see on the right here, it looks a bit complicated, but all it means is that if you're uh, so this is the class from your training data. So if a particular example x t has the class uh, omega t, but the classifier that you learned h does not predict this class. So it means that your classifier gives a wrong label for the current training example. Right, count how many of those are. So this i is what is sometimes called as the indicator function. Right? So if the condition inside of this is true, this becomes one. So all this does says is just count the number of wrongly classified examples, and then take a, take a weighted sum of it. We will see how these weights come into play, and give me that theta. So this theta star, which would minimize this particular sum, right? What does training a decision tree mean? A decision stump mean? Training here just means figuring out the value of theta. What's the value of theta that I should use for this decision stump? Which basically means where should I place this bar here? Should I place it here? Should I place it here? Should I place it here? So if you think at the beginning, say if all the samples of my training set uh, have equal weights and say I s come up with a proposal for theta which sits in here, right? And I say everything to the left is red and everything to the right is blue. So my line is somewhere here, right? Then what are the errors that I make? So I say everything to the left is red but I have one, two, three, four, five, six, say seven examples to the left, which are wrong, which are actually blue, but I say that they are red. I can use that information to calculate some cost. So this thing you here, you could think of it as a cost. In this case, the cost is seven because I made seven errors, right? So the training of a decision tree basically means how should I move this line so that I make the least number of errors, right? In this case, since each one of these dots or the training samples matter equally, it's just counting the number of points which are wrong and making sure that the number of wrong classifications are wrong. But in principle, you could attach this idea of weight to each sample. For some reason, I think that this sample must be, uh, must be classified correctly even more than the other, uh, other uh, samples. So maybe it's okay for me if I make a wrong classification for this point, but I really want that this particular point be correctly classified. Then this is accounted through the weight, right? So is this idea of training the decision stump clear? How should we come up with a value of theta which best splits your, uh, your data here? Accounting weights for each sample into account. Taking each, uh, taking the weights of each sample, right? Okay. Right. So a little bit more on an algorithm to figure this out. 
right. So, what is this theta? So, where should I stop this line, right? What you could do is say the minimum value that x1 can take say is 0 on the left end here and the maximum value that the x1 can take is say 10, right. I go I compute what is the error if I make this line as my decision boundary, right. So, I say everything on the left is red, everything on the right is blue. What, what are the mistakes I make? All the ones in red here are the mistakes I make. And so on as I move I can compute the error for different thetas and then basically take that theta for which the error is minimum. Right. Okay, so this is an algorithm kind of formalizing what I said, but in an algorithm form it looks a bit more complicated because it does on multiple dimensions. For example, you could have multiple decision boundaries right. So, one across x 1. So, you could move across x 1 to to break your split your space into two parts, but you could also move about x 2 right. Depending on how the data is distributed maybe making the split around x 2 is better than making the split around x 1. So, you need to do this minimization about all your training dimensions. So, suppose your feature vector has 5 training dimensions x 1 till x 5, then you need to make this experiment on or this test on every dimension and take the minimum over all the dimensions. This will give you a good decision stump right. Okay, so, when you actually code you could go through this pseudo code here and basically it does what we explained here. Okay, then now we uh, are at a position where we know how to describe a decision stump which means with just one of these small edges. We know how to get one of the small edges. This algorithm here tells us how to get the capital H which is the strong classifier by this idea of boosting. Right. So, essentially what we do is we have our training set which con uh, contains T samples. So, each feature vector along with the corresponding class. Then we have this idea of weights attached to each sample. When we start there is no reason to say one sample is more important than the other one. So, we say each one of these samples has a weight which is 1 over t. So, if you have 10 samples each one of these samples will have a weight of 1 over 10 right. Then we do a process which is iterative right. So, we need to come up in this case with capital L number of classifiers. So, L weak classifiers h 1, h 2, so on till h L and we see how to come up with each one of these classifier uh, in this idea of boosting right. The first step we need to do is to figure out a h of x. So, which decision stump should I use as say the kth classifier. So, this is the first iteration what should be the decision stump I should use in the first iteration right. We have our training data in the previous slide we saw how to come up with a decision stump. The previous uh, algorithm gives us a candidate decision stump which says if the jth element of my feature vector x. So, say x 3 is greater than the value 3 then my classification is plus 1 or minus 1 something like this right. Once we have uh, this candidate of weak classifiers h of x, then I need to select a classifier which minimizes a certain error epsilon of L. So, the way to think of this is the following say we have 10 weak classifiers, 10 decision stumps. Now, I need to figure out one of these decision stumps. The way I would do it is that I want to select that. Uh, decision stump or that classifier which has the uh, the least error. So, here epsilon refers to the error and this error is a weighted error which takes into the wrong classifications into account. So, what we see here are the samples which are classified wrongly. I weight them and add them up and this is my error for the classifier say h 1. I do the same for h 2, h 3, so on till h l and or say if I have 10, 10 of them and choose the one which has the 
least one. This would be my first classifier, right? Then, if you remember, we had this idea of the voting power, this alphas that we had, right? The algorithm suggests that we take the alpha based on this particular formula. We'll see why this formula. So it's basically a logarithm of some values which is based on the error, uh, error that we computed before. So essentially the idea would be if the error is small, you should give it a higher weight. If the error is more, you should give it a lower weight. And it's in the logarithmic scale. Right? Then comes an important step. Now we have selected, say, the first classifier H1. And we have assigned it a voting weight of alpha 1. Next, what we do is to recompute the weights. Because once we select alpha 1, it may happen that, say, the samples 7 and 9 were classified wrongly. So our goal here is to make sure that the next classifier that we select, so the H2 that we select, should be such that it works better on these two wrongly classified uh, examples. And the way to do this is by making the weights of the samples which were wrongly classified higher. So basically it corresponds to this condition here. Right, so what this means is that your LF weak classifier made a, correct, uh, made a prediction which matches with the actual label. Otherwise means it doesn't match. So essentially what this reweighting step uh, entails is to increase the weights of those elements which were classified wrongly, so which is this case here, and decrease the weights of those uh, uh, elements which were already classified properly. So you, you, you think that, okay, these are already done properly. I decrease the weights of these a little bit, but I increase the weights of those samples which I classified wrongly in my previous iteration. And the goal is to iterate this till we are satisfied. Right. So what does it mean we are satisfied? This may mean that our capital H that we have, so the strong classifier we have, reaches some desired accuracy. Right. So suppose we say we want an accuracy of 0.9. So on our training set, say if my accuracy is 0.9, I'm happy, I stop this loop. Or say there is no other good classifier left. And so maybe in a list of your candidates, you exhausted all of them, or either you exhausted all of them, or the new classifier is just as good as a random guess. So using this new classifier yields you no new information, then it's also a good place to stop. And so there are a few criteria when you can stop this training process, right? When you're done, you end up with this strong classifier, which is this capital H of X, right? So at least roughly is the idea clear what's happening here? How do we, how do we come up with these guys? So this is the, uh, the algorithm that was mentioned in here. So Essentially, training the classifier means figuring out the theta. Right, so once you are the beginning, right? Yeah, you can do it at the beginning. Yeah. yeah. And the other thing you just yeah. can show the this circle. So when do we learn here F2? Because now we need to learn F2, right? Yeah. So, where so there are multiple ways. So one, say, let's say the easy way to think about it is uh, say you train the classifiers before you make any boosting. So suppose you end up with, say, 10 candidate classifiers, H1, H2, H3. You do it before. It's just which, so what we will see, at least in the example, is which one to choose. This is just the easier version of what is written here. So suppose you have a candidate H1, H2, H3. The boosting al algorithm will tell you which one should I choose first, say H2. What should be the power of this guy, alpha 2? Then which should I choose? Then which should I choose? You could do something more as well, but let's focus on this idea where we choose amongst a given H, uh, a candidate, a number of candidates of H. Okay. Okay, so I told you uh, about this voting power or the voting weight alpha. And the formula for the voting weight essentially is this. So it's one half logarithm of one minus the error rate divided by the error rate. So it's the error rate of the LF weak classifier, right? So the way to see this graph could also be the following. So suppose you are here. If your error is, uh, uh, is 
0.5 of, of, of your or the error rate is 0.5 then it means that you are just as good as random guessing which means that the voting power you have should be 0. So, the, if you plug in 0.5 into this formula log of so this becomes 1 minus 1 over 2 divided by 1 over 2 which is 1 logarithm of 1 is 0. So, you get 0. So, if you are as bad as random guessing the power to vote you have is nothing is 0. Whereas, if you are more accurate the power that you have increases. So, the more accurate you are so which means the less errors you make the higher your voting power the, the more your say the more uh, your decision will be counted in the final say. Then the other step that we saw is this idea of the uh, the weight update right. So, we want to weigh down those points which were already classified correctly and weigh up those points which were previously classified wrongly and you will see a bit more how this exactly works in the uh, in the example that we will do. <laughs> okay. So, again the idea with the weights is the following the ones which are misclassified by h of k should get higher words in the next step. So, in h of k plus 1 you should account for this right. And finally, once we go through this uh, this process say we end up with L classifiers capital L number of classifiers each one of them has its own voting powers. We will fit in in this formula. So, we will take the linear combination of each one of these individual V classifiers take the sign of that uh, of that function that you get and then uh, the answer that you will get will be the class result. So, either it is a plus 1 or a minus 1 which belongs to the class omega 1 or omega 2 right. Okay. So, I would like to do a simpler example on the board first before going back to the uh, before going back to the slides. Hopefully, this helps understand the algorithm that we saw before. Uh, if I could get this down. I am not sure how to get this down ok. Ok, okay. while it does we can start our example. Okay. So, let us take the following example. Uh, let us say we have the following let us say we have the following training data set again with two axes x 1 and x 2. Right, and okay. So the uh, right, so we have this data set, which pluses means they belong to the class omega one, and minus means it belongs to the class omega two, right? Or plus one and minus one. Right. In this case, let's say we propose some candidate weak classifiers H, and in this case. Uh, let us let us also give some coordinate values to this. So, for example, right, and uh, what we will do is propose a candidate H 1 and this guy says H 1 basically says if my X 1 is less than for example, uh, 2 the the so this is one decision boundary so x1 less than 2 everything less is a positive example everything right is a negative example this is what this classifier says this weak classifier says similarly we could uh, come up with another classifier another weak classifier h2 which is a decision stump which says if x2 is less than 
4. Everything on the left is a positive example, everything on the right is a negative one. Similarly, we can come up with a third one, which could be, say, this one. And this basically says that everything to the left of, uh, say, 5 is a positive example, everything to the, to the right is a negative example. So this decision training that we said before determines these values 2, 4 and 5, so the thetas that we have. In this case, let's say somebody says use these classifiers and amongst this tell me which is the best combination, right? If you remember uh, when I said before when you have these decision stumps, you also have the opposite of these decision stumps, right? So you could just flip the sign and this will give you a new decision stump. So let's say H4 is nothing but the opposite of H1, which means X1 is greater than 2. H5 is nothing but uh, X2 is greater than 4. And H6 is nothing but X3 is greater than 5. <coughs> so are these decision stumps clear how this works? So what H1 means is that it says everything that's to the left of this line here is a positive example. Everything to the right is a negative example. But of course you can see that it's not correct because you have, uh, let's make this also positive. So because you have two positive examples on the right which are wrongly classified, right? So each one of them is not perfect. Now we'll use, kind of, we'll go through this idea of the boosting algorithm and see how do we combine these individual uh, classifiers and make them stronger. Is the question clear? No? Or, yeah? And why X1, X2, X3? Ah, sorry. You're right. So all of them are, are X1, basically, because the test is on the first dimension. You're right. I was just confused with the number. So it's always X1, because always the test is on the first axis. In principle, these decision boundaries could be not just on X1, but also on X2. You're right, so the conditions here are all on the x-axis, so the x1 dimension, right? Okay. Is the problem here clear? Okay, if that is the case, then what we could do is the following. We could, uh, what I'll do here is to maybe summarize the steps of the, uh, of the algorithm. So first, what did we say in the uh, Ada boost algorithm? So we have the training set, we have them there. Then we said that we should compute, uh, oh, we should assign weights to each sample. And since we are at the beginning, all the weights are the same. So let's say first is assign equal weights, right? And these weights would be nothing but one over the number of training samples, right? This is the first step. Then once we have the, uh, the weights, then the next step is somehow to figure out the, the error rates, right? So we want to find out what the error each of the classifier makes, right? Okay, so let's do that. Uh, you need to help me out here. So what are the errors that H1 makes? So maybe it's easy if I give some names to these guys. So let's call this sample A. B, C, D, and E, right, okay? What are the errors that the, uh, that the classifier H1 makes? Uh, I can call this wrongly classified points. So what are the wrongly classified points that H1 makes? B and E, that is true. Right, we need to do this exercise for all of them. So what's the error that H2 makes? So H2 is X1 less than 4. What's the error that H2 makes? So H2 says everything to the less left of 4 is positive. Everything to the left of that blue line is positive. So what is the errors that it makes? 
That's true. So it makes B, C, and E. And so B and E are to the right. They should have been negative, but they're positive. And C is to the left, which should have been positive, but it's negative. Is this clear how we came to these errors? OK. Then we need to do this for all of them. OK. How about H3? Right. Right. So, uh, so we have the first three. So the next three are actually kind of easy to pick out because they're just the opposite. So if F1 makes B and E as errors, what would F H4 make as errors? It would make all the remaining points. Right? So you, it would make A, C, D. Right? It would make A, C, D as errors. Is it, is, it, is it correct? So if I make a mistake, do tell me. Right? What would H5 make as errors? It would make the opposite of this guy. So it's A and D. And what would H6 make as errors? Everything but C, which would be A, B, D, and E. So is this clear? How did we uh, come up, come out with these errors? Does somebody has a different solution? OK, if this is not the case, then, uh, then we could do the following, right? <laughs> what should we do then? Next, I said that we should compute the, uh, the error values for each of these classifiers, and then pick the one which, is the, which makes the least error, right? So now we have equal uh, weights. Then let's say we compute error EL. Right, so this is the error that each of the classifier H, each of the classifier HL makes, and then pick the best one of them, right? So help me out with computing the error for each one of these classifiers. And uh, we also have this concept of rounds, because if you remember in the algorithm, we loop through this boosting algorithm many times. So suppose I call this round one. So what would be the error rate for, uh, for the first classifier? So the error rate, if you remember, was basically it was you sum over all the all the wrongly classified elements, right? But since they had weights, you should sum over the weights, right? So if say the uh, if say the sample B and C in this case B and E are wrongly classified, it means that you need to add up the errors due to B and E, which means that you need to add up the corresponding weights, right? So what would be that value here? There are five points. Two over five, right? So it's just two over five. It's because the weights of all the points are the same. So let's do one thing. We can make another column for the weights. Again, we divide them in terms of rounds. So what's the weight of each of the samples in the first round? It's 1 over 5, because there is no reason to say any one of them is better than any other. So it's 1 over 5, 1 over 5, 1 over 5, 1 over 5. So everybody agrees with this, right? So if this is the case, how did we come up with this 2 over 5? It's essentially you sum up the weights of B and E. B is 1 over 5. E is 1 over 5. So it's 2 over 5. Since it's the first round, you could just also compute the number of wrongly classified ones. What's the one for H2? Right. 
So I guess you got the idea. So this would be 3 over 5. This would be 1 over 5. And since these classifiers are opposite of each other, H1 and H4 are opposite of each other. So their error rates would also be 1 minus them, right? So if this guy gets 2 right, this guy, or 2 wrong, this guy gets 3 wrong. And so they should sum up to 1. So this one would be 3 over 5, 2 over 5, and 4 over 5. Okay? Then the, uh, okay, so which H should we choose? Given these values, which of the H should we choose? So the goal in the end would be to come up with a uh, with a H, right? So we want to come up with a H, this capital H, right? Which was the sign of a combination of different H, small H's, right? So I need to put in some small H in there. Which one should it be? The H3. Why? Because the error rate of H3 is the smallest. It's one over five compared to all of the other ones, right? So I use H3 as my first, uh, first weak classifier. Then, if you remember, we had the, uh, so compute the error rate and choose best. So sorry for the bad writing, but it's in the slides as well, if you want for reference. Then uh, we need to compute the voting power of each of these classifiers, right? So it means we need to compute This voting weight alpha L. So what was the formula for the voting weight? It was something like alpha L is 1 over half log of 1 minus the error rate of the best one that you chose divided by the error rate. So what would be alpha for H3? So it basically we figured out that the best uh, classifier was H3, the error rate is 1 over 5, so put in that values here, so it's 1 minus 1 over 5 divided by 1 over 5, that would be 4 coming out inside, so if you just do, it's 4 by 5 divided by 1 by 5, so it's 4. So do correct me if I make a calculation mistake here. So this would be log of 4 and 1 half, so this we could say one half log of four. So one half log of four times H3 is my first classifier. Right. Okay, now I'm done with the, uh, with the first round, right? So I chose H3, right? Which means that I made the error for the point C. And if you get this idea, uh, if you come back to this idea of boosting or increasing the weights of those, uh, those elements or those samples which were, tra which were classified wrongly, right? So now when we compute, so we are kind of uh, at the end of the first round. So what we could say is that we computed a voting power uh, for this particular classifier. Then we could say that then we could ask the question, are we finished? Are we finished at this point? Is it sufficient to say I just use this weak classifier and it's the best combination that I have? Do you think are we finished? Yes, so it depends on us. So for example, if you're happy with the error rate of 1 over 5 or 0.2, you're finished. But say for this simple data set, we could actually get an error rate of 0. So in this case, we would say we are not finished because we have still one of the example which is not properly classified if we just use H3, right? So we are not finished. If we are not finished, so if, if you are finished, then it's good. You just return your H of X that you have till now. If you are not finished, then you need to, uh, if no, then you need to recompute the weights.
right? You need to recompute the weights such that the ones which were wrongly classified are prominent and one which are rightly classified are not. And the, the formula for this was the following. Uh, so, so the weight, so the new weight is uh, 1 over, so this is just from the slides, so 1 over 2 by 1 minus epsilon or the error rate old if so if we are right we use basically this formula if we are wrong then we use this formula And so this is just from the slide. So this formula basically uh, gives more weights to the to the uh, to the elements which were wrongly classified and less weights to the one which were rightly classified. We'll see when we put this formula in, you'll see the effect, right? Okay. So once we have this, now we come to the round two, right? So we said that we are not happy with the classifier that we have, so we need to go to the second round, right? So what's the weight for uh, for the point A in round 2. Has the point A been rightly classified or wrongly by our previous classifier? No, th by H3, so the previous, yeah? So it was rightly classified, right? So rightly classified means we would use this formula. No, sorry, this formula. Uh, what would that come out to be? So it's 1 over 2 divided by, so what would be this epsilon for our, for, or the error rate for the best uh, classifier that we chose? It's 1 over 5, right? So what we end up is uh, 1 by 2 times 1 minus 1 by 5 times my old weight. What was my old weight? It was 1 over 5. Right? So if I do this, I get 5 over 5. So I get one eighth. So does everybody get one eighth? Okay, I mean you take your time and tell me if it's one eighth or not. So if the if the uh, point was correctly classified, it's this formula on the top. So one over two times one min one over one minus error rate times the old weight. Is this clear or or not? So the calculation is simple, right? So it's 1 over 2 just comes from 1 over 2, then 1 divided by 1 minus the error rate of the best classifier in the previous step. What was the best classifier in the previous step? H3. The error rate of the best classifier is 1 over 5. So just plug in 1 over 5 here. Right? So you have 1 by 2 times, so this, this is the new weight of A is 1 over 2 times 1 by 1 minus 5 times the old weight, which is again 1 over 5. Right. And if you do this calculation, you'll come out to be 1 over 8. If somebody gets a different number, tell me. Okay. If that's not the case, then I assume that it's correct. And it's 1 over 8. Right. What's the one for B? What should be the new weight for the point B? The same, one. the same one, because B was also correctly classified. And if you look at the formula, since the old weight is the same, and the, it's the same classifier you use, for all the correctly classified ones, you, will, you should get the same value, right? So we don't need to actually calculate for all of them. We can just put 1 over 8 for B, 1 over 8 for D, and 1 over 8 for E. Does everybody agree with this? What should be for the wrongly classified one? So what should be the new weight for WC? Right, so it's 1 over 2 divided by 1. So just to WC new is 1 over 2 by 1 by the error rate was 1 over 5. 
and the old weight was also 1 over 5. So this 5, this 5 cancels and it's 1 over 2. All right. Okay, is everybody happy with this calculation here? How we got 1 over 2 for the, uh, for the element C? Right, okay, and there's actually a property if you do this enough times, you will find that the sum over, uh, so the sum over the wrongly classified uh, points in the previous iteration will always add up to 1, oh sorry, will always add up to 1 over 2. So in this case, the, the uh, wrongly classified element was just C because we chose H3 which makes the error with C. The sum over all wrong ones means just the sum over C and it adds up to half. It's a property that comes out of the formulas and since the sum over all the wrongly classified ones in the previous step add up to half, it means that the sum of the, the ones which are uh, right also adds up to uh, half. You may use this to make some of the calculations faster, but if you just follow the formulas that we had written in here, it's fine as well. And so, I will leave that out not to confuse you. Okay, what's the next step? Now we recomputed the weights. What should we do then? Right, so we need to go across the boards and then compute the new error rates given these new weights for each one of the classifiers again, right? So it's the step two and we want to figure out which classifier to use. Now we want to compute these error rates again. What's this error rate now for H1? So the error rates are basically the sums over the elements that it made wrong. So it made wrong predictions. H1 would make wrong predictions for B and E, which would mean it's the sum of 1 over 8 and E is 1 over 8. So it's 2 over 8. Right. Okay, what would be for H2? So B, C and E. B is 1, C is uh, 2, uh, 1 plus 1 plus 2 plus B, C and, oh sorry, yeah. Sorry, it's 1 over, okay, what I will do is uh, just, yeah. Yeah, 6 over 8, it's correct. So what we could do is the following. We could write 1 over 2 as 4 over 8. This I could do just to make the calculations easy. So the BCE would be 1 plus 4, 5 plus 1, 6 over 8. So I hope this is the same number you came out with. What's the one for C? It's 1 half, oh, which is the same as 4 over 8, just to make the comparison easy. What's the one for 4? So A is A, C, D, right? So 1 plus 4, 5 plus 1, 6 by 8. What's the one for 5? A and D, so 1 plus 1, 2 by 8. What's the one for uh, it's the sixth one? It's 1 plus 1, 2, it's 4 by 8, right? Do all of this look correct? So it's the new error rates, just the sum of the weights of the wrongly classified points. Right? Okay, let's get back to our flowchart. Now we have our new error rates. It says pick the one which has the least error rate. Which one is it? Right, so you're right, so it's either H1 or H5 because both of them are 2 over 8. Right, so when it's the same, you have to have a tie-breaking rule, and in this case, let's say we always pick the one which is on the which is on the top. Is it fine? So we pick this one now. Two over eight. 
this would be my next best classifier to add to my big H. Right, so this would be come here. Right. What next? So we did this. We chose H2. The next step is to compute the voting power. H1, so yeah, you're right. It's H1. So we computed that H1 is the best one, then we need to compute its voting power, which basically meaning means to put the put the best uh, error rate into this formula. The best error rate is 2 over 8 or 1 fourth. If I put 1 fourth here, it's 1 minus 1 over 4 divided by 1 over 4, so it's log of 3. So it's one half log of three. Right. Okay, so we are the next step. Then we come down. The, we ask the question is this sufficient? Should we stop now? So which are the two that we pick? Yeah? Right, so you have two lines, but you have to remember that they are uh, scaled by a certain value. So log 4 is uh, bigger than log 3, and uh, right, so log 4 is bigger than log 3, so the weight of H3 would be more than the weight of H1. Right, so if you look at the points which are made mistakes, so H3 makes a mistake with C, and H1 makes a mistake with B and E. Right, so now, for example, uh, which means that uh, just given these two, H1 and H3, because they are weighted in the way that they are, so the first one, so the, the error due to H3 is given more weight than the one due to H1, uh, than the one due to H1, you can't always say that you will be right. For example, if you, ca you, if you choose H3 and it gives the error with C, since the weight of this guy is more than the one that uh, for this guy, even though this may say this will give C as the correct answer, since this has a higher weight than this guy, it's not sufficient. Right? Is this idea clear? So we cannot stop now, or we should not stop now. Okay, what's the next step? If we choose not to stop, what's the next step? We compute the weights again. Right, so I need some help here again. So what's the weights of the point A for the third round? How would we do that? Yes. Yeah. No, it's not 1 over 6. How did you get 1 over 12? Right. So we, one thing is not to think too much, just come back to the formulas. Which was the rate for the, uh, for the best, classifier we, uh, best classifier we had? We chose H1, which had a rate of 1 over 4. Uh, H so omega a is is it rightly classified by H1? Yes, it's rightly classified by H1 because it only makes errors with B and E. It's rightly classified, so you put the value of one over four in here. Right, so if you put the value of one over four here with the old, so let's do one of this. So so what's the new one? New is one half. 1 by 1 minus, what's this guy? 1 over 4 divided by the old value of the A, which is 1 eighth. Right. So if you do this calculation, they would end up with 4 and 3, 2. So this is 1 over 3 times 2 is 6 times 2 is 12. So 1 over 12. So you're right. So this is 
1 over 12, right? So I will not go through each one of them again since we have limited time, so I will just write the answers, but the concept is the same. If they are rightly classified, use this formula. If they are wrongly classified, use this formula. And what you would end up with is these numbers which I did at home. So you can treat this as a homework, so go home and check if these values are correct or not. And so you will end up with these uh, numbers, so I'll again do the same trick to write them with the same base so as to help with the calculations. Okay, given this, these are the weights in the third round, right? Then what should I do? Once I have the weights, what do I do? Once I have the weights, I have the weights, sorry. Then I compute the error rate and choose the one with the best error rate. Right. What's the uh, error rate on the round, round three? So these are just the additions, right? So B and E. B is 3 over 12. E is 3 over 12, so this is 6 over 12. What's BCE is 3 over 12, 3 plus 4 is 7, uh, plus 3, 10. If I do some mistake, do tell me. Uh, C, so C has the weight of 1 by 3 or 4 by 12. Then H4 is A, C, and D, so it's 1 over 12, 5 over 12, 6 over 12. Then uh, H5 is A and D, so 1 over 12 and 1 over 12, so it's 2 over 12. And H6 is A, B, D, E, so it's 1 over 12, 4 over 12, 5 over 12, 8 over 12. Do these numbers look right? Okay, if there's some mistake, do tell me, but I think they're correct because they do match with what I have from before. Okay, so now we've computed all the errors. Which is the best one? Yeah, so which one does it correspond to? Right, so the lowest error rate is 2 over 12, which corresponds to H5. So we would go here and say H5. Right. Like before, we need to do the voting power, or we need to compute the weights of this classifier, which you would do here. So uh, 1 over 2 over 12 is the same as 1 over 6. If you put 1 over 6 here, it's 1 minus 1 over 6 divided by 1 over 6. It's 5, log 5. So this would be. Right. So now we ask again the question, is it uh, sufficient that we, uh, that we stop now? And again, so the way to one of the ways to analyze would be to, uh, to look what the errors each of these guys make. So H3 made error with C, H1 made error with B and E, and H5 made error with uh, A and D. So if you just look at them, they're all exclusive, right? So none of the errors are covered by the other ones, which is good. But then you also need to take care if the weights are correct or not. And so last time we argued that for point C, if we just use H1 and H3, it was not sufficient because uh, log of uh, four times a prediction which could come from here, which would be uh, say plus one, can overpower the one from uh, H3. But now actually it's, it's good, I think, because if, for example, two of them give C as correct, so for example, this guy and this guy both say, both give the correct prediction for C, but H3 gives a wrong prediction for C, then do the H1 and H5 overpower the decision of H3? So the, the way to look would be, 
uh, what's the power due to h3? h3 is one half log four, and h uh, yeah and uh, yeah and h1 and h5 are one half log three and one half log five. So if both of them agree with each other, you add these logs. Adding two logs is the same as multiplying them inside. So log of three times log of three plus log of five is the same as log of 15, which is greater than the log of four. And therefore, now you are in a position to say, okay, in case these two guys disagree, the vote due to the, uh, the H5 would overpower the disagreement and you would get the correct, uh, correct classification. So in this sense, now we are at a position where say, okay, we have come with, a, uh, we have come out with a sequence of or a combination of the classifiers with some different weights which is now able to classify our at least the training space perfectly. Right. Okay, so uh, with that, uh, so okay, before I finish, is this idea clear of boosting? So we had multiple, uh, we had multiple candidates. Here I just gave the candidates, but in principle you could also learn these candidates. Here they were decision stumps, in principle they could be any, any classifiers. And what we looked at is a way kind of we go, went through the whole exercise of computing the weights, computing the error rates, and figuring out what combinations and what voting powers. Right. Okay, so on, in the slides, there's a slightly more complicated example. You could just go through these slides. Essentially, they do exactly the same thing, but the space is a bit more complicated. Yeah. Okay, any questions on bagging or boosting? Okay. Do you think that bagging or boosting does help improve the classifiers. Yes, okay, if that's the case, then that's all from me and uh, see you next time.